And if you ever wondered what Mind X 1.0 was all about, it was between the 1 and the 10. And if you all thought about a number, it was definitely that 10 right there. Thank you, Mr. Lambriwanu, for your speech. Now we're going to have a small break, a 10-minute break. For those of you that just joined us halfway through, if you don't know what's going on, this is Alcohol Anonymous. Thank you for being with us. Those who laughed are the ones that I'm worried about. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, we will open the doors uh, so you can go out and uh, to the bathrooms. The service will continue. And also, we only have 10 minutes. So if you want any drinks, get them now. Because when we start the speeches, all service will stop, including the bar. All service will stop. So 10 minutes and we'll be back. Enjoy. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? It actually came at the right time because this is the title of Dr. Trichas' speech presentation. So guys, I met Savas at Michael Berardi's Address for Success public speaking seminar back in July, where he attends as a guest speaker. And as soon as I heard his speech, I understood why he was also a TED speaker, a TEDx speaker, not only in Athens, but also in Las Vegas. A big round of applause. <laughs> Savas told us that he is obsessed with human behavior. He considers himself a communications expert and has devoted the last six to eight years studying facial expressions, body language, and strategic attention management. With a PhD and, and an MA, Dr. Trichas has collaborated with many universities such as Stanford and organizations such as Bank of Cyprus and World Vision. He's also a university lecturer and an instructor at the Ministry of Culture and Education right here in Cyprus. I told you the title of his speech, it's right behind me. And please give a round of applause to our very own awesome TEDx speaker, Dr. Savas Trichas. Thank you. Sound good? Yes. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. So I was in this big leadership conference the other day. I was waiting for a colleague of mine to deliver his speech. The man's a genius. He's like a superstar in academia. Very friendly, intelligent, top researcher. So we were all really excited to see him. He gets on stage, starts talking, and it was awful. I mean, it was so wrong in so many ways that we kept losing our attention and just having these blanks of communication, you know? And you've all been there, right? I hope you don't get there tonight with me. <laughs> so we've been there in that keynote presentation, in that seminar, in that one-on-one -on -one communication. You just let your mind loose and you are every, anywhere else rather than there with that speaker, that communication. So we're here today to answer to a single question. May I have your attention, please? But before doing so, we'll have to um, meet some psychological principles. Basic, not boring, promise. Now, I have been standing in front of you for a minute or so. Yes. Has any of you noticed if I'm wearing anything on my hands? What? Watch. Which hand? Right hand. Excellent. Now, not many of you noticed that, but some of you did. And let me explain to you why. Because your attention works as a spotlight, okay? A flashlight. Imagine the light which is focusing on my face, it's my facial region, because it is the primary source of communication, right? So, other aspects of my communication remain at the dark, such as my hands and my legs. And it, that's the exact definition of attention. It is the allocation of resources and processing towards one aspect of the environment, which means automatically the withdrawn from other aspects of the environment. Now, we're at an, a good point to begin understanding how attention works. But in order to completely grasp the idea of attention, we'll have to play a game. You up for it? Yeah. Excellent. Now, it's actually a psychological experiment, a famous psychological experiment, but it's very, very easy. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you a picture 
of an open fridge, um, all you have to do is count the items that are packed on the two doors of the fridge, right? But you only have 15 seconds to do so. Once again, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a picture of an open fridge. And all you have to do is count the items that are packed on the two doors in 15 seconds. I'll do the counting. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, fourteen, fifteen. Stop. And, oh, okay. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you got above 30 items? That's nice. And how many of you got exactly 33 items, which is the correct answer, by the way? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. The key question now, how many of you are in a position to tell me the exact number of bottles on that fridge? Interesting, right? I mean, you had your spotlight on, you had your flashlight on, counting each and every item, but you weren't absorbing all the information from the environment, right? You weren't categorizing into bottles, jars, tins. You weren't perceiving your environment as it is. You perceived what you pay attention to, and what you paid attention to, I could control that. And I have another question for you. Has anything changed on my appearance? That's right, the flying watch. And how many of you listen to me skipping numbers? You are ruining everything. <laughs> anyway, most of you, I'll say that, were selectively blind and selectively deaf as regard my aspect of communication because you were counting items. You didn't see any bottles, you didn't see flying watches, you didn't see, um, you didn't listen to me skipping numbers. That is why attention is crucial. Because it shapes your reality. It shapes what you can understand from your world. So when you can strategically control other people's attention, every interaction you can make it useful. But when you are in work settings, when you're in business, you can make it profitable. And I'm not talking just money. I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I mean, gaining much, most from each and every interaction. So, in the remaining time we have, I'm going to give you six basic fundamental tools which you can use to engage people's attention. Okay, tip number one, minimize distractions. We many times do that mistakes. We many times want to finish that sentence, that thought, that thing we had in, my mi in our minds, but we uh, ignore the catastrophic force of distraction. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, I had to teach physical education to first, year, uh, first graders, that is six-year-old kids. Okay, So we're all like, OK, kids, now you have to put super glue on your legs and stick them on the ground, and then get your ball. Throw it up in the air and get it back. Throw it up in the air and get it back. When suddenly a beautiful white pigeon come and lands in the middle of the field. You know what happened? The kids were, oh my God, Mr. Salmon, what a beautiful pigeon. Come, 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 come. But oh, guys, eyes on me, eyes on me, because now we're going to throw the ball up in the air and then clap and then get the ball back. Nobody didn't even listen to me. They were all about that pigeon. They had their undivided attention on that pigeon. I could change my watch. I could bring the fridge from the previous slide. They wouldn't even notice that because they had their undivided attention on that pigeon. Like you guys, you, weren't, you didn't see any bottles. You didn't see any flying watches. You were counting items. So what I have to do is scare away the white pigeon first. Otherwise, I'm not passing on the message, right? And the white pigeon is an analogy of every distraction you'll ever have in your audience. It's someone playing with his iPhone. It's someone talking. It's, it's a noise. Minimize distractions. 
Change slide, please. Change slide, please. Change slide, please. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Another mistake we many times do is that in our attempt to sound intellectual, sophisticated, well-educated, we use all these fancy words and complicated meanings. And it, we even do that in PowerPoints many times. We, we load and load and put information inside, but our brain does not love that. We don't want to dive into complexity. We want, to, we want simple, straightforward things. I'll give you an example. I'm going to tell you two sentences, and all you have to do is choose the one you can absorb better, okay? Similar meaning. Sentence number one. The practical, um, sorry, it says something. <laughs> Sentence number one. We need to balance between theory and practice. Keep that. Sentence number two. The practical technocrat and the Theravamon dark intellectual comprise forms that are outdated at the same level that not only not facilitate, but actually inhibit the new birth of a new humanitarian type of human. <laughs> Keep it simple. That's right. I did some time learning that. Keep it simple. Unlock your body. Buy a show of hands. How many of you have you ever been into a friendly discussion lately, a family dinner, a beautiful night out at the Seven Seas at a charity event, cocktails and canapes? Everyone, right? Right. Okay, if I had a video camera capturing the interactions you had when you were all relaxed and you were just being you and you were like, oh my God, you're never going to believe what's happened. I'm telling you it was this, this and that. And you were three-dimensional and confident and energetic and you were just being you. And then the other day, the other day you go to your business presentation. Your nerve racking business presentation with outline information to hit on and slides to navigate and a time frame to consider and you go, hello, my name is Savas Trihas and today we're going to review 350 slides on communication. May I have your attention please? No, you may not have my attention because your fear of public speaking has sucked away any natural ability you ever had and you know you have because when you communicate with your friends, you are all over the place. So, first step, toss your notes. Every time you look down to your notes, you will sound robotic and you will lose connection with your audience. Another thing, try to bring more yourself into the conversation. Now, I'm not telling uh, don't follow any structure, but I am suggesting to bring some of your passions into the conversation. Because that's the only way to unlock the body and not over-process things in our head. Unlock your body. Don't bore their brains out. Now, another thing we know from brain research is that we only get 8 to 10 minutes of window spans of attention. Only 8 to 10 minutes if we are using the same format of communication. So now I'm monologuing, right? I'm lecturing. I only have 8 to 10 minutes, no matter how interesting is the topic I'm talking about. What I have to do to regain my new window is to simply change the format to a video, an example, a good story, some humor, some sadistic, something to keep you on their toes. It's like a mental slap. And when I do that, I see your faces waking up. Okay? Keep that, because I did mention stories, didn't I? Stories are an excellent tool to engage attention. Stories can make us see. Stories can make us feel. Stories can make us use our inner senses. There is actual research from, it, from the University of Harvard that demonstrates that when we're exposed to successful storytelling, there is this neurochemical called oxytocin, which is released in our blood. Oxytocin is responsible for feelings of kindness and cooperation. In other words, when we hear a good story, we lean forward and we are more acceptable to the meanings we listen to. But what's the point of telling you about how effective stories are if I don't tell you a story myself, right? 
I'm going to demonstrate my six and final points with a, with a story. Be aware of attention alarms. Now, I was with my son Christos the other day, and we were about to do our speech therapy exercises. Now, we're having some trouble uh, pronouncing the, the letter R, and we are working on that. So I was, okay, Christos, let me see your mouth, son. Dr, dr. And, and everything was perfect until the third minute when I saw Christos reaching his tiny pocket and he was grabbing on something. I didn't know what it was at that time. I said, Christos, what you got there, son? And he took it out and it was this tiny, yellowish, irritating Pokemon action figure. Whoever of you has babies, you know that, I, uh, that Pokemon. You know that. And I was, okay, Christos, why did you have to do that, son? I mean, that's all I get, three minutes, and then you, you play with your Pokemon, and we're never going to buy it. I was, I was building up frustration with Christos, but then, okay, I said, I, I'll do a better work next time. And three days after that, we were at the same place again, doing our speech therapy exercises. So I was, okay, Christos, look at train. You need to say train. And, and touch here, okay? Three minutes time, you know what happened? Yeah, not only did Christos took his Pokemon body, he had his opponent now, and in three minutes time, they were fighting in front of me. And in front of, no shame at all, they were fighting. I was about to get frustrated again, but then it hit me. It hit me, because Christos was teaching me a lesson at that time and not the other way around. Christos was letting me know the exact time I lost his attention, right? Because I was the grown-up. I didn't change anything on my game plan. Why should Christos? And then I got myself thinking, man, I talk to people all the time. Big audiences, small audiences, even one-on-one -on -one communication. Would it be great? In every audience I ever had, the people would get these tiny Pokemon action figures and they would flush them out whenever I lose their attention because I don't want to be talking to selectively blind and deaf audiences, right? I want to pass on the message. Now, and then I took it another step further. I mean, imagine, imagine you guys now, if I lost your attention, you flushed it out and, and I would say, one, two, three, four. 90 Pokemons, really sorry you guys, and they go back and regroup and try to get your attention back. Otherwise, you're not listening, right? You're thinking other stuff, right? And then I took it another step further, and I thought, are there any such mechanisms? I mean, I know you don't have any Pokemon on you. I, I hope you don't have any Pokemon on you. <laughs> but wouldn't it be great and are there any such mechanisms? Yes, they are. It's all these times you will start to uh, get your smartphone and start scrolling Facebook when I'm talking, and then these other times when you were looking at your clock and trying to hide your yawn, and uh, when you were looking above my shoulder to see that beautiful lady that was passing instead of listening to me, and my personal favorite, the zombie look. You know, it's that empty look you get when, when people are like, they're watching you, but they're like laser beaming through you and they're traveling to the supermarket list and what shoes too much with what dress. You know, ladies, right? Anywhere rather in that room with you. And what do you do? What do you do when you get these signs? You keep talking or maybe you go back to your six steps. Am I having anything distracting in my speech? Should I scare away a white pigeon first? Am I being too complicated? Am I using too many complex sentences, words, thoughts? Can I make it more simple? Is my body too long? Am I being too robotic? Can I bring more meaning to the conversation? Am I boring their brains out? Can I use a story, some humor, some visuals, something to keep them on their toes? Now, so the next time you'll find yourself trying to communicate in any situation, just think of the very first question we began our presentation with. May I have your attention? Please?
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Savas Trijas.